because I could I could edit this out. So anyway, so then we started already. By the way, yeah, we're on right now, but it's it's between okay, us. We're, we're guys. We're in the we're in the Friars Club. We could hang together. Okay. You're a legend. Absolutely. You've done a lot of stuff. <laughs> but before we get into your resume, I don't need the name drop. Ronette, Ringo Starr, Kiss. I got I got problems. Listen. You got a problem? I got problems. My wife wants to travel. I don't want to travel, Ben. How do I do this? What do I do? Uh, She's watching, Vinny. She's how watching. far does she want to travel? She wants to go to France. Can, I, I can't do it. I can't Have you do been it. to France? I've been to France. It's been there one so time. It's been enough. There. I've been there. Once enough. Once enough. That's it. You know, <laughs> everybody. I, have, don't you have a sister-in-law that can go with and take your place? And I just and, wish. So I just wish. Fun? I just. <laughs> I just wish. Everybody, we're we're alive. You guys are here. You're beautiful artist on record. Your ultimate intimate conversation with your favorite artist. I have a legend, and tonight this legend, he's going to tell me some life lessons in life. But he's worked with many. Ronette. Well, don't forget now, I've had three wives, so oh. I'm a little more experienced than you are. Now. You know what, Vinny? Three wives, and you worked at Rock Legend. Watch this intro. It's very professional. It's all happening now. Don't touch that dial. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. You're an artist on record. Your ultimate intimate conversation with your favorite artist. I am Stefan Dika. You're not. And bam, tonight we have a legend. The wonderful Vinny Poncia. The man has worked with legends from Ronette to Kiss. You name it, he's done it. Melissa Manchester, Martha Reeves. But we're going to talk about all this and much, much more. All right, Vinny, welcome to the to the. Uh, thank you, Seth. Great to be here. And Kenny uh, told me so much about you. I was anxious to actually get this done. You know, I know we've been... Uh, I've been a little remiss in getting back to you about it, but we are just <clears throat> hung up doing some stuff. But I'm anxious and I'm glad to be here. Really I'm happy glad, to be here. Actually. I'm glad to be he, here too. He talks so highly of you. He does says he you really? have to have. He says you have to do the show because what he does in editing it and gives it to you is like a gift that you always have. Show it to your grandkids, which is a, a metaphor for, <laughs> <laughs> for whatever. <laughs> It's all fun and games till somebody gets pregnant, Vinny. <laughs> <laughs> it's all fun and games. But, Vinny, I am so glad you're here. You don't understand something. First of all, when Kenny even told me your name, I'm like, no way. I get the, Because your name has been in my world forever, forever. Records that I had. I Because back in the day, I would, and to this day, vinyl is back. I grabbed these records, right? And I would read the credits, but I would listen to these, this music. They were storybooks of our lives. So then I, here I am. I'm going to show you how example how Stefan would do it. He'd listen to these records like this and open up the gatefold uh -oh. and look, look at the stars. And then I'm looking, and I and I love songs like on Ringo Starr's, this Ringo Starr record, which is a great right. album cover. And then you go into like All My Mind. You go, God, what a great song. And you go, Jim Kelton is on it, Billy Preston, Klaus Vormann's playing bass, right? Then you go, Vinny Pons here, R. Starkey wrote the song. Ooh. Then, again, I go, Devil Woman, the same thing. Ringo's playing drum, Jim Kelton, Klaus Vormann, all these incredible people. Tom Scott's on the horn, Richard Starkey. Then it goes, V, it's Pons here. And it's right here for you people, yeah, that's, that's, right? Uh... And then, growing up and during my world in Brooklyn as, as a kid, disco starts. Where did you grow up in Brooklyn? Canarsie. Yeah. Canarsie. Oh, right Canarsie, by that's right. Canarsie. Yeah, Sheepshead Bay, Canarsie, all there by Rockaway yeah. Parkway, off mm -hmm. the Bell Parkway. Then I got, yeah. you make me feel like dancing. Another, another thing that you might know of, I don't know if you know these songs, but I'm going to tell you I, that you wrote these songs. It's crazy. I even remember them. <laughs> it's crazy. <laughs> So here I got you here, and I'm so honored. And and I don't even know where to begin with your story, but man, you, you take me take us back. I mean, it's rock and roll started for you. Well, we grew up in Providence, Rhode Island. <clears throat> Peter Anders or Peter Andrew, Peter Anders was well. We, were, <clears throat> we had this group called the Videls. This was like in the late '50s and so, and uh, we had a local record out that we put out. And it did pretty well, actually, went to number one in Providence, mainly because my whole families would call in and request it, and they would go buy it. You know, I sold like about 5,000 copies locally. So we were excited about that. Yeah. 
so we had a connection with this uh, a friend of my family's lucky call in New York City who was at Southern Music. And they had Buddy Holly and there's a lot of other people. So we hooked up with him in New York and we got our first uh, recording contract with Joe Sherman and JDS label who used to produce Paul Anker and Connie Francis. And he was a great songwriter. He wrote Graduation Day, him and his brother, Joel and Noel Sherman. Matter of fact, the other hit on that label JDS was Barry Mann's first single who put the bump so it was the Vidal's and Barry Mann on that label and uh, uh, and then we uh, just went on from there started writing I have to tell you a funny story about yeah. after we had our first local record out we had we were doing some other things. I was in the show band working at the Copa, like a lounge band, and Peter was doing some other stuff. But we got together. He went to New York, and he stayed at the Forest Hotel. So he stayed at the Forest Hotel, and in the lobby all night hanging around were different musicians and publishers, and there was hanging around the lobby. He used to live there during the week was a man named Doc Palmas. Oh, yes, legend. <laughs> Doc Palmas, okay? And now, we had grown up with, you know, how many hit songs he's written. And so uh, Peter made friends with him and started playing some songs for him. And uh, he was duly impressed. You know, he said, you know what? I'm going to go up to Hill and Range, just with, where he was a staff writer at that time. And you come up and, you know, you'll play some songs and stuff. And maybe, you know, maybe you'll, we can get you a gig up there writing songs. I said, well, imagine that, getting paid to write songs. And at that time, the, uh, uh, Doc was there. Uh, Otis Blackwell, uh, you know, guys who were working there. Uh, Kenny Rankin, uh, a lot of guys who were writing a lot of hits for a lot of people at that time. Otis Elvis, right? This, it was uh, they owned Elvis Presley Music Hill and Range. Elvis uh, was part of that. So Peter goes up there with Doc the day before I was doing something else, and <clears throat> talks to them. And they listen to the song. They said, "Great, great. We'll give you a deal here. We'll give you fifty dollars a week to write songs." And we said, "Wow, imagine that!" Because we had moved from Providence to New York, you know, after being in Providence and you know just looking to do anything, uh, give me a reason to stay in New York. What a great reason. You know, we had a job working at Hill and Range with guys like Doc Palmas, Morty Schumann, Otis Blackwell, all, all these great artists. Burt Backwork was on the seventh floor. Lieber and Stola, who used to work at, at all these places. And so he calls me up at night and he says, and I met him uh, that night and, and he said, listen, we get a job at Hill and Range with staff writers. They're going to pay us. They, give, they offer me $50. We offered $50 a week. So I said to him, well, did you tell him about me? Like I was your partner. We wrote all these things. So no, I didn't say anything because I was like too afraid to like upset it. He said, but tomorrow I told Doc and Doc called him up. They said, they're going to bring you up tomorrow. So I said, great. So I came the next day and the both of us went up to Hill and Range now. We met Paul Case, who was the general manager there, the professional manager. He ran the, ran up, ran the place. And he, said, and he said, I want to introduce you to my partner, Vinny Poncia. He, we wrote all these songs together. Paul says, great. We'd love to have the both of you here. He said, you could split the $50. <laughs> you can split the $50. <laughs> I thought we were getting $50 a piece. We had to yeah. split the $50. We got $25 a piece <laughs> for writing songs at Hill and Range in the next room from Doc Palmas. And our uh, room rent, we stayed at the Forest Hotel, uh, yeah. a legendary hotel right on 49th Street. The room went... The room rent where we stayed was forty nine fifty a week, and we were making collectively fifty. So we had five, fifty cents, you know, to eat like at you know wherever Tad Steakhouse for dollar nineteen and stuff. Yeah, so that was the funniest, the funniest moment. He said, "Oh, welcome, Vinny. Well, we don't, yeah, you guys would be great together. Split the fifty dollars." <laughs> and that was my first venture into the big. And this was the Brill Building, you know. This is when yeah, George the legendary was in Berlin, you know, you know, at that point. A great story. I love that story. So what was the whole so we vibe? We went on from there. The, the, in the Brill Building, what was the whole vibe? Was it just like the whole... It, it, the Brill Building, when mm -hmm. you, you know about the Brill Building. Yeah, of course. Yeah, take and, like, and Every vision. floor, there were different... Like, Lieber and Solar were on the seventh floor. Elvis Presley and Hill and Range was on the eleventh floor. There were different record companies, smaller record companies, Big Top, and, and, and they were there. So 
every day. And there was a, uh, two restaurants. One was Jack Dempsey's on the left, and on the right was a place called The Turf. So uh, everybody would gather in The Turf, people who were unknown or just, just starting, and the people who were already famous used to hang around in Jack Dempsey's because nobody could afford to go to Jack Dempsey's. Yeah. And every day, you know, you'd be out there in the back rack, we're getting out of a car, Jackie Wilson, here comes the crest, let's go here, we're having lunch with, you know, Don Covey and, and all these up and coming groups from Brooklyn coming in. And every day was like that, you know, <clears throat> we would live right across the street on 49th Street at, at the Forest Hotel, you get up in the morning, you go on hanging around at the, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the surf at the turf restaurant, and then before you know it, somebody's walking in. Oh, you know that? Oh, that's uh, uh oh yeah, remember uh, you know that song? Hey, little girl, and I, that's D D Clark. Oh, oh, hi, D. You know, and they come over and they talk to you, and like, and, that, and that's was the breeding ground, you know, for everybody in Brooklyn, because that's where everybody migrated from. All the groups and they went to, you know, that was their mecca. That's what they, they, you know, they aspired to do. That was the, asp you know, the inspiration, and that's the aspiration for uh, uh, aspiring for, to, to be there with those people in that environment. And we actually were there. We belonged because we actually worked for Hill and Rage Music. I mean, twenty-five dollars a week apiece. But hey, <laughs> who's did you end up getting a raise? Did they end, did they end up giving well, you a that, raise? That's like, what, yeah, well, that's how it works. Like you, you, you get that, and then you work for a while. I don't know if you know the break, how that works at publishers in those yeah. days. Everybody, yeah. the song pluggers, you know, like Snuffy Garrett, who produced Bobby V and say, like, who else he produced, would come by, would make a trip to New York, and we'd go to, uh, you know, <clears throat> Alden Music where Carol King, that was right up the block. They were in 1650, Neil Sedaka. And they would go and look for material. Hey, I got a session with Bobby V coming up. And, and your professional manager at the publishing company would say, okay, we need songs for Bobby V. We need songs for Jimmy Clanton. We need songs for this, this, this. And you would have a list of yeah. different kind of artists that everybody, all the, all the little cubicles would be writing for. So if you got an, a, a B-side on a Jimmy Clanton record, maybe you got, you know, $75 a week. Yeah. And at that point, he would also have to be good friends with Phil Spector. Wow. And when Phil would make a record, he would always come to see Paul Case. And he, I mean, I know I'm long-winded about this, but no, be was, long. Paul, Case had, Paul Case had an old <clears throat> phonograph, you know, and, and Phil would play every new record before he put it out. He would come to, to Paul Case because he had an office also on, on 63rd Street on the east side. He was still in New York and, and California. And he would play all Phil's record before it comes out because his theory was if it sounds good on this horrible record player that Paul Case has, I know I got a great record. <laughs> so one day he introduced us to Phil, you know, we would be sat around talking. And eventually at that time, Phil was, uh, was and Ellie and Jeff Barry and Ellie Greenwich, you know, they were like kind of like parting ways. So he was looking for diff different people to work with. So uh, we got together with Phil and uh, we started writing songs for the Ronettes. And, and then the, uh, I think the salary went to 150 a week. Then we went up to $75 a piece a week. Wow. Yeah. So, you know, now we could eat at the at Jack kings. Dempsey. Because of kings now. <laughs> oh, yeah. But this, but every little, every little step you took along this road, every, every little, every little milestone, every little bridge that you crossed always made you feel so good about something that you always wanted to do. And, and not only me feeling that way, but the Kenny Vances and the Jay and the Americans and the Crest and the Johnny Maestros and all, all the people that were coming into New York. We loved it. We didn't care if it was $25 a week. We would have given them $25 a week. To, I mean, you're going to work next to all these people writing songs. You're going to be in this environment. It was your own little world. It was like Times Square in that area, 49th Street from 42nd to 57th Street. And those blocks, there was some amazing, amazing young people creating. I mean, you know the, you know the history of, you know, Carol and Jerry, Barry and Cynthia, Neil and, uh, you know, Neil Sadaka, Howie Greenfield, plus all every other, every other people in the building, just, Jerry Lindbergh and Mike Stoller. It's crazy what you mean. Yeah. I mean, these, pe these people were there every day, though. See, it was every day. And you... 
like you morphed into this, like you became like, oh, hi, Bert. Hi, Bert. Oh, yeah. yeah, how are you guys doing? You know, and stuff like that. And so that's the way it really started. I mean, for us, I mean, we were just two kids from Providence. And, you know, I mean, our mothers and fathers would have to send us $100 every once in a while <laughs> to be able to eat because we were a little crazy sometimes. Was your but family Doc Thomas was, would eat, Vinny, Doc would eat. I'm sorry. Well, they were in Providence. They yeah. were in Providence. So, you know, before we started, they, you know, we'd have to, you know, they'd have to send us some some survival money. But Doc Palmas was greatly, greatly responsible for us starting. I mean, his his generosity, you know, because he'd be in he'd be up all night and we'd be in the in the lobby. There's pictures in his, of us sitting in the lobby writing so He never went to sleep, you know. And so we, you know. We used to go to Madison Square Garden with him. He wanted to go to see the fights, and we would take him over there sometimes in his, in his chair or help him over there. And he was very, very instrumental and very generous in taking care of these two young kids from Providence who were, you know, and just <clears throat> amazing in awe of anybody and everybody that was around us. He was, to this day, I, I owe him a great deal. Doc, I, a great deal. What was he, he like? Was what kind of person guy. was he? Really, he was so... Doc Palmas was just, he was just lovable. But, he was um, just a big teddy bear that you loved, smart guy, hip, cool, all those things, you know, great blues singer. He had an innate feel for that, you know, for, he was just, he was a, he was a down to earth guy, you know, he was just, what, he was, the, he was just, the, he was a blues singer, you know, but a genuine blues singer, you know, I mean, he was just, it was like, you know, one of those guys who, and he was a great songwriter, and Marty, Sh Marty Schumann, his partner, was equally equally as talented and, and special in his own way. There were some of the songs that he wrote, Marty. Uh, it was just a great time. And all the people that we got to meet at that early stage, this is like 1962 or something wow. like that. This is even just, you know, before the Beatles. Before you the know, British Invasion, yeah. Why we're still writing songs for like Barbara Lewis and people like that, you know, and and they had a label, Big Top, Johnny and the Hurricanes had records out on that, and and uh, Ray Peterson and uh, Curtis Lee, uh, they were, Phil actually produced a couple of those songs early on, uh, Corina by Ray Peterson, I don't know if you remember any of these records. I know these songs, yeah, you, you know, the music you Pretty Little about. Angel Lies by Pretty Curtis Little Lee. Angel Lies, yeah, right. yeah. Yeah. Right. The Phil Spector <laughs> actually produced those two records, but never really wanted, he, he loved the idea, but he never really wanted to take credit for them. But he, he just like, yeah, I did that. Yeah, I wrote I wrote oh. Spanish Home, you know, but those like. What Phil, you know, Phil Spector did? Oh, yeah. He produced those records. Oh, but but did he did he, did he, for Big Top Records. Big Top Records was a subsidiary of Hill and Range, mm. you know, and he produced those records. Like, it's, it's wow. not funny. I mean, Phil Spector. How did he? Would he? Would he? How did he win? Because he Phil was, a, because Phil's office was on Sixty Third Street. Mm -hmm. Phyllis Records when it first started, his first records, you know, when he first started, and he grew up in the same environment as we did. Only earlier with Jerry and Mike, Jerry Lieber and Mike Stola, Doc Palmas, uh, uh, all the guys at Atlantic Records. Phil was all part of that scene early with Ahmed Erdogan and stuff. Before he moved to Los Angeles, he was. But he was he young, was right? How old he was? How old was he then? He was then? maybe eight, twenty years old. That's crazy. Twenty years so old. You know, well, he was still recording. He was still living in New York when I was working with him. He hadn't moved to Los Angeles yet. He was still living in New York. So uh, this is this was the environment. I mean, I mean, it sounds like you know, like. <clears throat> something that you would make up, you'd write for a film. Like how you it know, should be a film. Well, I mean, they've tried to do it a million times, but it's. It, I mean, the people that were. Yeah. I mean, little. I mean, we, like, we would just be sitting in the turf all day. Everybody kept writing. So, oh, yeah, I got a great idea for the song. I remember this. I was sitting there one day, and there was this guy that used to come in with a acoustic guitar. It was kind of like like almost like the Willie Nelson guitars that were yeah. like beat up and stuff. And, and uh, I met him and he said, Vinny, come here, I want to play your song. I think Atlantic, Atlantic wants to record this song. Uh, it's a great Don, Don, his name is Don Covey. So uh, he starts playing me the song, you know, I said, a chain, 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 chain of fool. Oh, I said, that's a great song. I love that song, Don. He said, yeah, they want to do that Atlantic. 
with uh, I think uh, somebody Aretha Franklin. They wanted to, they want him to do it with Aretha. I said well, that's great, and he starts playing it on the acoustic guitar like his his soulful acoustic. This is in the middle of a restaurant, like and I'm I said you know I'm not going crazy because we're all we all yeah. trying to dip our toe in the water, but he you know we don't know he doesn't know that's gonna you know you know what that began for him, but you know he just listened to him playing it and singing it. Those seminal moments of just like, I mean, it was just later on. You say every time I hear that record, I'm in the turf and Don Covey is playing for me on this broken guitar, and he's playing, and he's singing the song. You know, <laughs> and later on, of course, he did so much. He's such a yeah. he's a great, great talent. Don I, I mean, a but lot of people work with him. I mean, these are you guys yeah. are the legends behind the legends. It real, real. Well, I mean, it was. It was hard to explain. It wasn't. Uh, uh, <clears throat> it wasn't a like a rivalry or something mm. like that. It was. It was more. You know, somebody throwing the gauntlet down or lifting the bar. You know. Oh, you know. It's, you know. It happened all over the music business. Not just. Not just us. It happened with. You know, uh, Pet Sounds and Sgt. Pepper. Everybody was. You know. And that was the great thing about it. Everybody was always trying to raise the bar. You know, we wrote songs a certain way. Then when we started writing at the Brill Building, there was two or three uh, <clears throat> partnerships around us. Guys like Otis Blockwell, Kenny Rankin, you know, Johnny Jungle Tree, John Leslie McFarlane, a great songwriter in his own right. And you would hear their songs and you would say, wow, well, we, know, we know what we got to do. We got, it's got to be as good as that or better. You know, mm -hmm. so, so it would everybody had everybody was inspired to, you know, to, to pick up their game. And so it was it's an amazingly I mean, it was like like Artie Rippey used to say, it was like a garden where all these seeds were just thrown out and they all started sprouting, you know. Yeah. And that little yes. environment and that 20 block radius. It was the most exciting time I've ever spent in my life to this day. And I've been, you know, with the Beatles and Elvis and everybody. But that time. For for creative people, it was it was an amazing opportunity for a lot of people to take advantage it's, of, and they did. It's, well, you're a kid too. At the same time, you're learning. You're oh yeah, we're like, like 19 years old, you know, 20 years old, but you know, trying to figure out, you know, yeah, we're just trying to figure it out, you know. And then you run into this guy, and then the next thing you hear Johnny Maestro, you hear that voice you say, "Wow." <laughs> Oh my God, or Johnny Jimmy, Maestro, or, beautiful! Right, or the Skyliners record comes out, and you say, "Well, I mean, what is that all about?" And we had a great lead singer too, Peter Anders, who was with our group, uh, of Vidal's, and later on with the with the Trade Winds. But it was just one, you one know, thing <clears throat> one thing after another that just inspired you. You got up and look. Phil was the same. Everybody was the, cut from the same cloth because. Phil would call me up one day. He said, "Come over here. I want to play something for you." So I go. I go over. Uh, he was at. The, I think it was at the Plaza Hotel. So he's got acoustic guitar. He said, "I want you to hear this. This is a new song that just came out. I love the song." And he starts playing. Do you believe in magic? So listen to this line. It's like trying to tell a stranger about a rock and roll. Do you believe him? And he was just floored by that. And that's the way it was. Somebody because it was such there was such a variance of talent and it was all spread out and it came from different places and different inspirations and stuff like that. It wasn't like the cookie cut every road, but it wrote the same song, you know. You know. No, the music definitely it identified every, the artist too. Yeah. yeah. It Absolutely. Like, it, it, it like each artist you gave them their sound, which that song like Chain Fools, you know, whatever. Yeah, I'm just giving an example. That's right. what we, you know, right away, you know, you talk, think about right. these songs, the Ronettes, you think about right. their song, you know, it just maybe the artist didn't write it, but people like you behind the legends, you're making the legends and you, you're almost giving them their own personality, you're making their own identity, right. you're giving them their red cape to fly, basically. Well, yeah, and at that uh, and at that point, they were just starting to have the singer songwriters going with John Sebastian, because from from Hill and Range, we moved on to Kama Sutra after that as, as uh, a staff writers too. But it was, a, it was, a, it was that, that's, that was a wonderful time. I mean, John was, Sebastian, huh? And then it just yeah, John Sebastian did a lot. I mean, Kenny yeah. Rankin was, was a friend of ours at that time. He used to, there was a little Johnny Jungle Tree, <laughs> John Leslie McFarlane, who, who wrote uh, Stuck on You for Elvis, and he wrote Little yeah. Sister. <laughs> with little Sister. Schumann, you know. And that, that, that line. No, little no, sister. no, Little Sister. Little Children. I'm sorry. Oh, little Children. Little okay. Children. Yeah. I mean, you know, 
Just those. These guys would come in. We would work all day. Then at six o'clock, when everybody, all the office people used to go home, that's when all the wolves came out. We'd all come upstairs. Everybody come upstairs. Now we'd sit around the piano. Let me hear. Then you play your new songs and stuff like that. And J- Johnny Jungle Tree was great. We used to call it, his nickname was Jungle Tree. John Leslie McFarlane. He actually produced the first Aretha Franklin album. Wow. But he was a great song. And he used to sing. His version of Stuck on You, how he wrote it for Elvis, you know. Hot in the kitchen, hot in the hall, ain't gonna do you no good at all. I mean, we just like sit there, you know. I mean, these, I mean, pre- precious moments. They said, well, why do you want a book? It does nothing to book. I could never write it down. You just had to be there. We're just, oh you my know, God. And he was great. You know, a little children, why don't you go outside? I'm asking you. And you'd be playing on the piano that we would work on all day because we used to hang around together. And then Rankin used to come by and play some stuff on your talk, like, you know, totally different jazz kind of thing. Bobby Scott came up one day. He said, listen, I got a song coming out from the Hollies. I, I, I really like it. I hope they don't screw it up. You know, <laughs> the road is long with many a winding turn. You know, what? Incredible. But, uh, these were just guys. I mean, we were just guys hanging around. You know, you know. It, it was just. It was just. She ain't heavy. You know, he ain't heavy. He's my yeah. brother. What a great! I just uh, yesterday <laughs> on driving in the car came on Sirius Radio, and I'm driving, and it, the song to this, it's just timeless. This music because it takes you to another place. You can have any trouble in the world or any thought. That music gives you. A whole other world. It makes you think. It's your, it's your therapist. Is that music? It's but therapy. how many guys that wrote it? That's just like in your office or when they're off and they're just playing all this stuff. Everybody's <laughs> playing all those songs. It was, you, you know, you you don't say wow. I you know it was like it was just how, how, wow. What what about the thing where you just said to me right now? I hope those guys don't screw it up. How many times have you written a song? And well, thinking, of course, that's what everybody was because the guys who. You know, guys with Bobby Scott, they were very talented. You know, they were these guys were talented. Guys, Jock Palmer, Morty Schumann was a brilliant arranger. You know, when they wrote Suspicion, <clears throat> that 7-4 bar in, in the middle of it. You know what I'm talking about? Suspicion taunted my yeah. heart. Gong, 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 gong. So that's like a 7-4 bar. That nobody was doing that stuff. But you just took it. That's how you learn. You say, wow, what was that, Morty? Morty said, well, it's 7-4. This is how it goes. And you said, wow. This is from, I mean, you're learning from, you know, the guys, who, <clears throat> you know, who, who, you know, invented this stuff. You yeah. Know? Yeah. Just sitting with Jerry Lieber and Mike Stoll is unbelievable. Same thing, you know, just, you know. Sitting with those we, cats, we, huh? Well, uh, we were writing and we wrote New York's a lonely town. I forget what song we had. We had a uh, Redbird with uh, Jerry and Mike. And then I uh, wrote this other song and then he would look at it and he said, Vinny, this is, this is, uh, Time and mine. I said, yeah, it's a rhyme. He said, that's not a rhyme. That's a bastard rhyme. This is, you, know, you couldn't f- figure another word to come up with time. You had to say mine. Yeah. Was, <laughs> this Jerry Lieber talking to me, you know, he said, come up with another rhyme with that. You know, <laughs> and, he it down. and then he stopped laughing, you know, and then the guys would like, and and I'd look at him like, well, you know, because he was my, he was, these guys were all our mentors, you know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> It's my you can figure that out. Or you had to go to mine, or you can't run crime. You don't know another, you know. <laughs> and they used to laugh with each other because we were the kids. So they were, then they said, no, don't worry about it. You know, you know. They give you a hard time on that. It's just Jerry Lieber and Mike Stoll. You know what I mean? You know, it's not, you know. <laughs> but busting the chops is a part of the whole thing as well. Yes, it's an, it's a, you know it's the initiation. You know, it's, 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 <laughs> and it's, it's a little the, love. Those with, those are the those are the great times in the sixties and the sixties. It, it was it I'll was never great times. Replicate that. No, Carol, Carol and Jerry, Barry and Cynthia. You know, the new songs that they would come up with, and, and uh, with especially with Phil and Bimbo. After he cuts Love and Feeling, he's in Los Angeles. He calls me up on the phone. He said, "I got to play you this." We had we go we used to go to. to uh, New York to uh, to Los Angeles and recorded Gold Star on the songs that we wrote, like Best Part of Breaking Up and Do I Love It with Phil. And I used to play on the sessions. And then uh, we came home and then uh, he stayed in and he, and he cut. And he, so he calls me up. He said, I got to play you something. So I just cut. So I, I said, he said, you listen. I said, so I listen. He said, you never close your eyes anymore. And 
I'm saying, is that on the right speed? <laughs> I say to Phil, because, you know, you don't know what medley sounds like at the beginning. Of the, I'm that saying, low. is that the right speed? He said, yeah, that's the right speed. What are you talking about? Of course, it's the right speed. I said, wow, it sounded like it was like, well, you know, when you slow a racket down, because that's the first time I heard it. You know, you're really not used. To, that's how how inventive he was. Whatever he did was always something, in my opinion, different and special. I'll talk about him as a songwriter, producer, and artist, and everything else is a whole other story. But, you know, I remember, you never close your eyes. I thought, that, I thought he was playing a 45 at 33. <laughs> I felt so embarrassed when he said, that's the right, that's the right tempo. And then he played the rest of the I said, oh, yeah, I'm sorry. He said, <laughs> funny things like It that. is funny. I mean, these are fabulous stories, tidbits of these classic songs, which it's so funny to see it being made, to hear it being made, and come come alive. Yeah, before it even comes out, you know, who's well, I'm listening to. I'm not saying to myself, "Well, this will be the most performed song in BMI history." Yeah, right? <laughs> I'm not thinking that. I'm no. just thinking, well, is, is that the right speed, Phil? <laughs> Vinny, did you realize that you were like right then? In this, no, in the moment, no, history is being made. That's the whole thing. You're not. You're not. You're not. You know. You're. You're. You know. You're. You're immersed in what it is. You're so busy trying to be as good as or better than anybody else around. Now, you, you know, you don't have to be better or something. You just want to be as good as and feel like your music and what you're doing is competitive or it sounds like it comes from that <clears throat> from that tribe of, of, of creative people, you know, that, and that, and all you need is somebody so oh, I like that's a good song, that's a really good song, you know. And f when Phil started working with us, that was the validation that we needed, the, you know, at, at that point, you know, because you don't yeah. know. I mean, you don't know. I mean, uh, you're writing a song. I mean, you're in a, in a basement somewhere, or you're in a in a, a little house in Nebraska, Dylan's writing a song. He don't know what that's uh, it's going to be. The Beatles are in, you know. When I later on worked with the <clears throat> with the George and Ringo and, and on all the album, uh, and, <laughs> and George Harrison, who I, I did a lot of work on Ringo's album. He was a great guy. He said, Vinny, we were just trying to write Chuck Berry songs, <laughs> you know. And then I, you know, I mean, obviously that's opposite. <clears throat> oversimplifying or being simplistic yeah, about it. Yeah. But that's what, that's what that's what we're just trying to do. We just love to five. Just, just try to we cover songs. Trying, right. We were just trying to write those songs. And then we ended up writing of course our own songs, but their what their inspiration was and what they were trying they were so moved and so affected by it that you know like we were in New York when you know when everybody everybody was trying to do the same thing. Of course basically it's all the same age group kind of thing, you know, mm -hmm, people mm -hmm. are you know, early 40s and stuff like that all grew up together in music when it changed from, you know, the pop music changed from, you know, Perry Como to it's Fat Domino. You, you know, it's so crazy when you talk about Harrison because they were trying to get like Chuck Berry, the American. They wanted to right. be the American. Right. They were taking our music and, and Chuck was taking the blues and which his band was really Johnny Johnson for you to right. really know he was right. his guitar he, player. Yeah, Johnny Johnson gave him all the inspiration the way Johnny used to play in the right hand. That's where Chuck Berry took a lot of those licks from. That's right. See, a little history here for you kids out there. It was the piano player for Chuck Berry. But um, but right. it all came, it all like came here from Chuck. Then it goes, you know, you guys also, you know, with your songwriting and the people that were surrounding you, it was a big part of the Beatles world too. It's like they, they want to know what's crossed the waters over there. It is. Look at this. Exactly. It's like a magic box. Like what are they right. drinking? What's in the water over there in New York that we need to right. know? Right. When the Stones first came to America, the first thing they want to do, we have to have dinner with Phil Spector. <laughs> That's the first thing they said. We want to be, you know. That was funny. That uh, that is funny, huh? Because he was like, yeah, he's like this. this oh, he was a, he was just a bigger fan of good music yeah. as anybody else was. I mean, him, that whole crew: Jerry Lieber, Mike Stoll, Backrack, Doc Palmas, Morty Schumann, all the people. How Carol, Jerry, Barry, Cynthia, Neil Sedaka, you know. There was a lot of other people that I'm leaving out. I love but all that. They were all of all all had the same purpose in mind. They they just wanted to write. They loved writing songs, and it was it was <clears throat> it was it was like 
wow, plastic. <laughs> well, we don't have to use this anymore. We can just do this. It was like a new invention or something that revolutionized, you know, songwriting at that time, writing pop songs for, for, for such great artists. I can't yeah. overlook and, and can't give enough credit to the artists that were fortunate enough to have those songs, the artists that came about in those days, you know, all yeah. the artists that came out of, out of that, all the great songwriters that they wrote for, you know, you guys all have the right ingredients, you, and I always say it, the perfect soup. Even even the songs that weren't popular, there's an album that I have. It's it's called Joyride, and it's ELOs on it, and, and Barry and Cynthia wrote a song, The Best Something Is Yet To Come. I, it was the title. It was a movie with Desi Arnaz Jr., but they wrote, and I think they're singing on it together, and, right. and it wasn't a big hit, but it's such a great song. They just Even their songs that weren't hits were great, you know, and I'm like, oh, and I remember looking at the credits, as I found your name, reading my favorite records. You know, right. it's just all this great stuff. Now, when later on, you know, you encounter all these cats, like the Beatles entering your life. Um, El How about El Elvis, too? You encountered him? In your well, we, we worked for Elvis Presley Music. Oh, yeah. It was Hill and Range, but one of the things you did when you were a staff writer at Hill and Range, like I told you, there was all these little cube, like you see in the movie, little cubicles with a little 66 key piano, <laughs> a desk, a record player. So was it soundproof or anything like that, the cubicles? Not really. No. Not really. I mean, Otis Blackwell was next, next door. I mean, you know, the songs that he wrote, you know. Oh. Uh, but, uh, and then you would write your songs, and then you'd go to Associated and make your demos. And every office... After seven o'clock, there'd be all kinds of music going on. Come on, I just want you to hear this. And you would have a demo of a song you just wrote. You know, you'd go over to uh, Associated Studios on 7th Avenue and you'd make your demo. I mean, you'd, uh, you'd spend three hours and cut three demos. It cost you $135 or, you know, for this and $30 for musicians. And But you'd have this stack of acetates in these records well, what the professional managers used when Snuffy Garrett or another producer would come in, what do you got for Bobby V? Oh, wait a minute. And they'd have these de these demos, the original demos of these songs. And that's why you could find original demos of, you know, of like Elvis songs and so cool. And whoever, whoever was right. But at night, we'd all get, we'd get, what do you got? Oh, I, wait, I, I just cut this the other day. I want you to hear this. Then you'd put it on. And they were acetate demos. And you were so you were so uh, involved with your music that you would just, especially a new song, you would just keep playing them and playing. We'll be up till twelve and I'll play that again, play that again. You had to get up, put the needle on, play it again. Yeah, yeah. About, and it was an acid thing. So after three days, it wore out. <laughs> <laughs> it actually wore out. So after three days, you could barely hear it anymore yeah. with all the scratches. They were like, Did "You ever see an acid thing?" Yeah. yeah. Really this hard thing was worse than you know. <laughs> we had a bunch of demos. No, I, we got. I got to call Associated get two more copies of that. This like this one won't even play anymore. <laughs> <laughs> the nickel on the, 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 the that, so that, that is great. A, that is great. You know, what, what, now, how about we encountering with the Beatles now when they entered your life now playing, you know, working on Ringo? Well, that was, uh, that was Richard Perry. Richard Perry was the uh, you know he was the great producer. Uh, he was a producer, but he, he he had a way when the more important a situation was for Richard, the harder he worked to make sure that that situation and what he was providing was equal to the talents and the people that he was working with. You know, he was, when he produced Streisand or Ringo or anybody that he did, you know, and he did Harry, you know, Harry Nielsen and anything yeah. he did, it always had to be over the top as far as quality work. And he would work his fingers and his brain to the bone to make sure that those records were the best that they could be for this artist. And he produced a, uh, an early album of Peter and I, Anders and Ponsier album for Warner Brothers. And he took that inspiration from George Martin, from what George or Brian Wilson would do or what Phil would do with something. <clears throat> he was really good at that. And so uh, we, w when I was a, a staff writer and producer at Kama Sutra Records, yeah, the Kama Sutra booted with Audi Rip and that whole gang. It was a bunch of uh, staff <clears throat> producers. This was after the Brill, believe. Richie Cordell, you know, Bobby Bloom. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, Tony Bruno, Richard Perry, B, Peter, 
uh, Bo Gentry. Uh, these, these, you know, we're talking about, you know, a lot of hits that, you know, I think we're alone now, Morning, Morning, uh, the, all the uh, Tommy James, you know, and... Tommy James, all that stuff, early stuff over there. And they, we were all like producers, all in, in the same thing in the office again. And Richard was uh, just starting too. And, and then he was, he was very, very talented guy. He was a classically trained musician. He, you know, he could play the oboe and stuff. He was very, very intelligent about that. So he, he really loved loved that situation from a production standpoint. That anything that we would do, he'd be interested in. We'd be interested in comparing notes at that time. Where before the other thing was mostly songwriting. Then when we moved to to Canvas Future, production became very important, <clears throat> and that's where he re he really started to shine. And so after that, he moved to Los Angeles, and, and the rest is history for him. What he did, yeah. the records that he made from Harry, and from you know Pointer Sisters, Barbara Streisand, and, oh, you know, and, and so we were working together. You know, sometimes, you know, I was associate producer with him, but a lot of the times I was writing for the artist that he was producing. That's how it happened with Leo. That's what happened with Ringo. And we were always friends from our our, uh, our Kama Sutra days together. So we were living out together. They said, Finn, uh, I think I got a shot at doing an album with uh, Ringo. Uh, come on, let's talk about it. You know, and then he'd come, I'd, come, I'd go over there. I said, well, you know, you know, I want you to write a couple of songs. You know, get you know, we'll do this. So, you know. And that's how. And then, but it was his idea to bring in the individuals, Paul, to work on a song. Wow. He, he, would get, he got Paul to work on a song on Ringo's album, which meant during that week we were going to cut a song, a Paul. McCartney song that he wrote for Ringo. So that week, McCartney would be in the studio. Well, that was one of them. McCartney oh, would be in the studio all week, and then we were working with Paul you know, on this song. And then the next week, George, we did a, a photograph and a couple other songs, Step, I think Step Lightly and stuff. And George would be in the studio all week. And so we'd be, with, you know, and then... Uh, in the second album with John with the uh, Good Night Vienna and stuff like that. So it was never, uh, never really all together. A couple of times in, when we went to London, I think Paul and, R and Ringo, I was in a session, we were playing a session. There's McCartney's on piano, Klaus Vorman's on bass, Ringo's on drums, and I was playing acoustic. I'm looking, I'm in, I'm in the Abbey Road, and I'm looking around. I said, "That's Paul McCartney's playing here. And Ringo's here, and Klaus is there." And, like, and you know, I said, I said, "Would you please, somebody, please pinch me? <laughs> I must be dreaming." <laughs> but Richard was able to facilitate facilitate that for all of them because he was a great organizer of talented people. He could put all these little puzzle pieces of the yeah. puzzle together and end up with a beautiful thing at the end. Beautiful it's, thing. To this okay. day. I love him. I love him dearly. He's a, he's a dear, dear friend of mine. I mean, you I talk about being good. in Abbey Road and, and just legendary studio. So much has been done there. And, and you're in the middle of this. And I was just talking to... Yeah, I, but these guys have been people. there before. Yeah, yeah but just <laughs> well, you in the middle. This guy from the East Coast guy right here. And I was just talking yeah, about yeah. Klaus Vorman to Glenn Matlock from the Sex Pistols. And we were right. both saying what a great bass player he is. And uh, just an incredible bass player, and you're in the middle of this wonderful session with these great people. Wow, it's legendary. Right. But Klaus is great. You know, when Richard was doing Carly on Your So Vain, the intro, you know, the record. that intro. Yeah. He said, you know, what do you got? Klaus, can you constantly play something in the, you know, in the intro there where we started? You know, it was like, it's like that mm. little thing. <laughs> I love that, Klaus. <laughs> Let's do that. Come on, there we go. You know, but that's the way it was. I mean, the, the the spontaneity of when you have creative people in front of you, and for Ringo's album, we'd have everybody from Clapton to Elton to Billy Preston to you know Lennon, you know, great guitar player, the greatest drummers in the world, Jim Keltner and all. Jim Keltner, oh my god! And, you know, and him and Ringo playing together, the two drums and the. When you have creative people. In front of you like that, it's it's 
it's it's it's, it's so really easy, so easy. It's so easy to to be inspired, you know. And they look to you, and so you know, yeah, let's do this. Let's do you know, Nikki Hopkins. Nikki's playing this week, you know. Oh, but Dr. John's coming in next week. He's going to open up and all this stuff. So well. Uh, Matt, when he comes in and he sits, sits down at the piano and starts to play, and the track starts going, and there you are, you're just like, uh, are you kidding? <laughs> Ringo's playing drums, Dr. John on piano, you know, Klaus on bass, Jim Kelton on there, you know, Jesse Ed Davis on guitar, or somebody else that's like really good like that. And, Every yeah. person that you're naming right now, I am totally fanboying out because it's such great, it's people I grew up with, these great musicians. Dr. John, what a voice. Even his own, such a night. I just love his Cajun New Orleans style sound. You know, all these Nicky Hopkins. I mean, come on. Right. And then Dr. John would say, but, you know, pass it on. He said, you, you got to bring James in. J James Booker. I don't know if you ever heard of James. Yeah. You heard of James Booker, right? You got to bring James in. So we act. He said, James, yeah. He said, see, do you like the way I play? He told me how to do this. He told Oh, and then we booked James, and James would come on and play some things or some other stuff that we had, you know. Stuff that, uh, I mean, I think you, it was James. I'm pretty sure it was, it was James. Or, or James, I think it was James. I mean, you got on on this Ringo star that, that right in front of me. Oh my my, the huge song right there. Oh my my, what a great you hear it all the time. Oh my my, all all the time. Great song. You got Billy, great Billy Preston keyboards on that with the organ and the intro, that whole thing, and the girls in the background. The singer is great. Oh. And then a uh, yeah, good couple, Maggie Bell on that. And, and on know. the backing vocals, it's Martha Reeves, Mary Clayton. Right. Come on. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> you know? Well, I mean, no, but now, see, but it, it wasn't like the. You know, later on, 10 years later, you couldn't get Mary Clayton to sing. In those days, everybody wanted to be on there. You know, oh, we've got there's some backgrounds in Ringo. Oh, come on over. We had Melissa come down, Joe Esposito. A lot of people that, you know, that we were friends with came down and played on it. Tom Saviano, you know. You know, it was just, it, it was, uh, wasn't something that uh, was very difficult unless you were after somebody who was like you know a little crazy. But Elton Love coming down, wrote a song for for Ringo Snookeroo would come down. Come on, let's go. And then Leonard would come down when he, when he did it. And oh, in the so studio, cool. everybody, everybody was you know was on board. Yeah, everybody was on board. These are fun stories. Cool. I mean, I talk I talk about those times, and I, I it's hard for me to you know to to to, to really. You know, paint the picture like like what it felt there. You know, it, it was just it was just unbelievable times. But like you said before, we were in the middle of it. We were just working. We yeah. didn't. You know, I mean, every once in a while you'd look up and man, like, Jesus. You know. <laughs> yeah. you know, but but your your objective was that you owed it to the people that were working for you to to make the thing you know sound the way the. And Richard was very capable, and we were all very capable of making it sound the way we thought would be worthy of even having those those people in front of you. And it, the one thing about that is that, like a guy like Preston or who would do you, you know, they would they would always, you know, well, what do you hear? You know, what do you hear? You know, what do you what do you? Well, I think it should be. Oh yeah, I got that. They, 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 it wasn't like you know. You know, just sit back there and wait for the guy to, you know, they were more interested in giving you what you wanted, you know. And so when you have a guy like that in front of you, Frampton or Overdoving or something like that, he can play anything. Yeah. <laughs> you know, they can play anything, those guys, you know, they can play it. But they want to know what you want for the, what you hear for this song, because it's the first time they heard the song. And they say it's like a Ringo song like that. They want it to be great, too. They want to play on a Beatles record and they sound like... You know, you know, so they relied on you and you relied on them. And it was a wonderful combination and a wonderful give and take of a create the creativity was like, you know, was like a thick fog. Yeah. Oh, it's, <laughs> you know, it's everybody enjoyed it. And you but you weren't even really, like really aware of it because you were a record producer, you were a songwriter, you were used to working in that environment where creativity was going on. Oh no, like no, nah, no, nah, you know, that's that doesn't really doesn't feel good. All right. You know what? I think I'm going to use brushes, Kenton will say. You know, I'm going to use Wow. Wow, who knew? And then he stopped playing and say, 
beautiful. <laughs> you know, but you would get that from a guy like a Jim Keltner or Jim Billy Kelt. Preston. I got this intro. I got it. I got it. I got it. I know what you want here. I said, you know, we want that barrel house piano. Yeah. I got it. And it was, and it was there. It was like asking you shall receive. I mean, I'm, <clears throat> I'm you guys worked as a team, as Debbie says in there. Yeah, team Yeah, but it was everybody. I mean, it yeah. was a team with like superstars and just the other guys were just this level and that level, this level, though. But everybody playing together it was very, very. I mean, on, even on, on even on the song "Photograph," you're on here. You're playing on this album, the acoustic guitar. They got you listed on here. And and oh, look, yeah. at, look at this lineup right here: the song "Photograph," written by Harrison, George Harrison, and and Ringo. But you have Keltner. You got Harrison. Mm -hmm. You have Nick, Nicky Hopkins, Klaus Vorman. Mm -hmm. You got mm -hmm. Vinny right here on the acoustic <laughs> right. guitars with Jimmy. Then you have right. also so on go. this track right here. I'm holding the vinyl right here, looking at this. You got Bobby Keys, who well, played a solo. sax player. Who did? Who's? Did, well, well, if we're gonna do a solo, like, well, we need a sax solo. Richard was saying, uh, let's call Bobby Keys, or we say to Ringo, Ringo, you know Bobby? Oh, yeah, I'll call, I'll call Bobby. He'll be over tomorrow. I just spoke to Bobby. He'll come by tomorrow. And he walks Bobby Keys. <laughs> and there's the song. And he'd get out there and stop. Well, I mean, I don't think I don't I don't think you could replicate or duplicate or just I mean, even if you made a film about it, it wouldn't have. I mean, it would have to have the, the depth of emotion that went, went on, that was running through everybody at that time, which it's hard to relate to somebody like you, Cam, because you grew up in that stuff. You knew what it was like, you know, to write songs. You know what it's like to have musicians as friends. You know what it's like to be in a band. You were in a band. You know how tough it is to create. You know how you always wake up in the morning and you hate what you did yesterday. What the hell was I thinking? I got to be better than that. You know all that. You know, you know what that feels like. Yeah, but your friends are a lot cooler than my friends, Vinny. I'm going to tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> well, we were we were fortunate at that time, but they all grew up the same way we did. You know, I like, know. Like, like George says, I'm just trying to write a Chuck Berry song. <laughs> it's, it's it's and then here, look at this. Everybody that's listening to this, you've all heard this song. It's a cover song you did. You're 16. You're you're on here playing here as well. With yeah. who's playing sax on that one? The mouth sax solo is McCartney. You got Klaus on bass. You got yeah. Harry Nielsen back in vocals on this one. Harry it's Nielsen. A, yeah, Harry Nielsen. Listen, Harry Nielsen vocals. spent a lot of his good friends with Ringo. You know? He was good. <clears> and he I, worked a I, lot I, in the studio. But he was unto himself, though, too, Harry. Yeah. Harry was an extremely inventive and talented person. And so I would sing a lot of backgrounds and stuff like that. And then uh, after we cut uh, your uh, you're 16. Uh, Richard said, "Oh, you want to go out and uh, and do the backgrounds, uh, Harry? You want uh, Vinny to sing with it?" Harry said, "No, no, I don't want Vinny to sing with me. I'm going to do it myself. I want to do it all myself, and with just with the, me and the engineer, you know." And he did all the different parts, and it's because uh, he was, he was, uh, you know, he knew what he wanted, Harry. Yeah. And I mean, we had a good time with him. You know, it wasn't like well, a slight against me. No, I'm going to do this. It's like, you know, no, I'm going to do it. I'm yeah. going to do it. Because he was good friends with Ringo. And he wanted to be, want, that was his gift to Ringo. He didn't want it to be just like a couple of guys playing acoustic guitar. And he, yeah. wanted, he, did, he did a great background. And if you listen to him, he would do all the parts themselves. You know, he would do the first couple of tracks. And then, you know how it goes. And then yeah. all the dub and do these other little parts. And they were they were beautiful because they were spontaneous mm -hmm. and it, it would have been different if we went out there with background singers and sort of like doling out parts. Like it wouldn't have had that kind of uh, personal touch that Harry was so good at. I mean, you, yeah. you know what a great singer he, he was, Harry. Nelson. Oh, God, amazing. One of the best, one of the best, you know, it's like when, he, when Richard recorded, uh, uh, <clears throat> God, my brain. That's okay. We, we we got editing tools. We could we could do anything. You could text me later. Add that in there. <laughs> you know, the, uh, living without you. Right? Yeah. A song written by Badfinger. Right? You know the. You know yes. The yes. So <laughs> Reggie's in the studio with him. You know, and he said, "Howard's looking at the lyrics." He said, "I can't sing this song." So why not? He said, "I can't sing." Oh, I can't believe I can't get the feel. Or oh, your face. I can't believe this evening. Or oh, your face. He said, "This evening." I would never sing that. <laughs> I go. I can't forget this evening. Or oh, your face. 
this evening, he said, Harry's, you know, Harry was, Harry was a real cool guy. He was like a Renaissance kind of guy. You know, if it was hokey or corny for him, he, he didn't want, he'd rather do just the opposite. Like, you know, like some of the music I put, the lime and the coca, you know. The he, lime you know, and the yes. Was, he was so, you know, he was really, really, really eclectic. He was really a Renaissance kind of guy. He said, I can't, I'm not going to sing that line. I can't forget this evening, you know, which is like, <laughs> You gotta sing that line, Aaron. That's the song. That's the way it sets up. He said, I felt like some stuff. He said, Oh, I can't forget this evening. Oh, your face. I said, Richard, what you said? He had to take him aside. Said, Harry said, You know, Richard Perry is probably the only guy in the world to convince Harry Nielsen that he had to sing that line because Harry was not. He, wanted he wasn't going to do it, huh? I wasn't going to do it. So Richard knew how to talk. He knew he how to talk. Back to and he said, oh, I'll do it for you. <laughs> he said, and then it turns out to be like, you know, like the classic that it is. But Harry probably cringed every time he heard the first verse, you know. So whenever he heard it on the radio, it became a hit. He's probably, oh, God, that line is the not me. Thing, <laughs> <the same> <laughs> <thing>. <laughs> but those are just little, those little inside stuff that was just, that was, uh, that was so easy. Richard, do you believe this? He doesn't want to sing the first verse. <laughs> <laughs> because this evening I said, hey, you got to convince them. And Richard was very capable of doing that. You know, he was, what a, you know what? You guys all worked on this. What a great record. I mean, Fiddy, there's too much to talk to you about, man. We got to do part two, I part know, three. I'm sorry, I'll, I'll, so I want to move in with you. We're going to <laughs> I'm gonna have to have you come on more and more with me. You, how, about, right. how about, you know, oh, you work here. We'll go quickly on the other side. I don't want to keep you busy too. And they'll be, they'll be sweeping behind you in the men's club over here. Talking no, to me, but um, you can edit it out. E even later on, you got how did you meet the guys from Kiss? Because you got to work with those cats. How did you, how did they come across your desk? Uh, <clears throat> I had uh, when Kiss decided to do uh, solo albums, my manager at that time was Rick Alberti, he worked for Bill Coin, mm -hmm. he worked in the office managing, you know, like. Work in management with Bill Coin, and uh, he uh, convinced Bill that I should do the Peter Chris solo album. Uh, at that time, I had already done, you know, the whatever Melissa Patty Smith, I think Scandal. I, mean, I had some stuff that I did that, uh, that was that was, um, and so I went in and did the solo album with Peter, and I became good friends. And we did the thing, you think, and I met met all the guys through that and at that time uh bill Coin and kiss were looking for a new producer at that time because uh not, not necessarily a new direction but just like 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 a boot in the butt you know at that time because you know they were like kind of <clears throat> not not maybe you know a little stagnant or something they wanted to go to another direction or kick it up or maybe get something a little more commercial, uh, mm -hmm. single wires or something like that. And they had Peter's album. Uh, and uh, they knew some of the stuff that I had done earlier and there's some other stuff that we, that I had worked on. And uh, uh, so through Rick Alberti with Bill Coin, I went over there and met with them and, you know, and then I met with Paul and uh, Paul and I hit it off pretty good. You know, and uh, he's, he's a songwriter. We get and ended up writing songs together and stuff. He did like tomorrow, that. right? Does that you co-wrote with him? Well, I was made for loving you. Too. Uh, I, well, later I on, made... right after you did the solo record first with Paul, right? And then you did I was made. No, for I did solo Paul. with Peter, not Paul. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Peter's solo album. Okay, that was my intro into the sweepstake of who's going to produce the next Kiss album. That was uh -huh. my entry. Uh huh. You know, and Paul said, "I tell you the truth, but and." He wasn't really fond of Peter to begin with. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, they really, they weren't uh, bosom buddies for, for a long time. Was Peter easy to work in the studio with you? Was oh, it, Peter was, was really easy to work with. Yeah. Peter was, you know, he's a goomba. You know, Peter, he, Peter was really easy to work with. He's from Canarsie, Canarsie Cat. Yeah. And, but Paul said, didn't really like most of the album, Ben. He said, you got to be honest with you. But I said, he said, maybe there was a couple of tracks on there or something. <clears throat> you know, a couple of songs, you know, that could qualify for, for a, a Kiss album. And then we went in and did like three demos on potential songs for the 
for the Dynasty album, one was a song called Dirty Living, which ended up on the album. He said, this is a really one that, that I like. He said, but uh, okay, let's go do it. Paul was one of those guys that once he made his mind up with something, mm -hmm. you know, that we'd go in and do it. And so that went through through the back door, through Peter Chris's album, through Rick Alberti. And I ended up with uh, Paul and Gene and did that album and the, and the uh, uh, Unmasked album. Yeah, a lot of on on Dynasty. On subsequent albums after that too. Uh, yeah, but on Dynasty, Shade. on Dynasty, there's a lot of great songs on there. You know, something I was made for loving you. Did you? Well, Paul is a very, very multi-talented songwriter and singer. He likes, you know, he just did a whole album, Soul Station album, was all '70s stuff. He could do all that Delphonic stuff. He Love grew it. up with that. He loved that stuff, mm -hmm. you know, and he knew that I liked that stuff too. So as songwriters, we wrote something that, that a little more, maybe a little more soulful, a little more r and kind of poppy kind of thing, kind of thing with that, you know, like Sure Knows Something and stuff like that. Things that stuff that Kiss wouldn't do anymore, uh, wouldn't do ordinarily, except like, except, say, for Beth or something like that, which was a, a, a departure. So it was fun uh, uh, for Paul to get with somebody, another songwriter that we used to work a lot all the time and come up with all these different songs. And we actually went into this uh, warehouse like in Long Island, you know, and for three weeks we rehearsed. We did every all the new songs that we Paul and I had written, songs that Gene had written, you know, with uh, Anton Fig was the dr drummer that we used on that at the time. And it was a great creative time, three, you know, because we would just break down the intros and then play, you know, and do all the arrangements. And uh, it was it was good for them to get back into the, you know, into that part of creating, you know, something like that, and something a little different, some things they didn't really agree with, and, you know, some things that we, uh, 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 put aside, didn't make the cut and stuff, and other stuff that, that that we did. But Paul Stanley and you know he was and Gene Simmons, they were the uh, they were the uh, yay and nay guys. I mean, if yeah. they liked it and we did it, then we did it. But uh, but but it came out great. It, it came out great. Yeah, stuff. they didn't mind. They didn't mind. Like, even like on you know, I'm sure knows something. You know, Gene playing the bass line and the, the pop things that it doom, 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 like groove kind of things. You know, so you know? good, which it's was so interesting good. for them because you know it was something different. You know, later on they said, "Well, it was too poppy, it was too there, it was too this, whatever it was." But while we were doing, everybody jumped in. Even Ace jumped into and jumped into. It. But they had their own internal conflicts going on at that time. Mm -hmm. I had to be above that and not really get involved in it. I just had to do the music. <clears throat> I had to do, you know, what Phil Spector always used to preach. Benny, this is all you can do. You got to write the best song that you can write. You got to make the best record that you can make. And you can't stop until you feel that's what it is. You know, like he used to say, his famous line that Phil used to say to me, you'll know that it's right. Because I should say, how do I know what it's right, Phil? How do I know? How do I know? He said, you'll know when it's right because it'll be right. <laughs> Good line, huh? It's a great well, line. So that was in your head in those sessions. That was in my head at the, do I like it? No, it's still not right yet. All right. And then it's right. How do you, because it's right. That's how you know it's right. Yeah. Yeah. But Paul, working with Paul, who's into the Philly sound, you know, all that great stuff. All of that stuff. Your songwriting, which he must have been a big fan of everything you. Well, you well, I mean, he he knew that I was a songwriter, you know, and then we wrote a lot of songs together, and he liked having some somebody that we were, you know, good personal friends at that time that we could, you know, bounce off, other than Gene, you know, that he was working with Gene, who was a little more, you know, organized and stuff like that. But, yeah. you know, Gene doesn't have all of that stuff that Paul can relate to. The, the you bet you bad guy, you, wow. you know, Gene Stylistic, knows those love things. Loves it. But for Paul... He lived that. So he loved that stuff. Paul loved that song. So anybody else who knew those songs, or who could sing those songs with them, it was like, you know, having a, you know, a comrade, you know, yeah. you, know you could share that with. And we put that kind of thing in, in you, into a lot of you the You did stuff a great that. thing. And you know what? It, you know, that Kiss era of Kiss Dynasty, it was a colorful era, but it was a great time. And it went with the times. It's almost like the Rolling Stones when they did Some Girls, you know, Miss You. Right. It went with the times. Right. I mean, exactly. it identified with Studio 54, the punk that right. was coming well, That's what we used to go every night. <laughs> we used to go to, me and Paul used to go to Studio 54 every night. Just go there and dance. Yeah. And dance, hang around, scene. Just, hang around. Just, just 
you know, go have fun. Yeah, it what was, a scene. It was, it was a pretty creative, I mean, I always, when I'm with someone that I know is creative and we're in there in the studio and making stuff together, I, I expect to be pushed and I, you know, and I expect him to push me and I always want to push him, you know, you know, I, I didn't, you know, I didn't try to prejudge it or, you know, judge something, but, oh no, well, I don't do pop, so I don't do, you know, well, okay, let's try it. Let's, you know, what do you mean? You know, <laughs> everybody has done something like that. It's, yeah. You know, look at Bowie, you know, if we wanted to do an RB song, you go to Philly, you get, you grab, uh, uh, what's his name? Uh, the guitar. Um, Sheik. She, oh, uh, Nile Rogers, right? Nile Rogers. You drive Nile, they're going to make a track. Right. Ding, 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 ding. A great track. And it wasn't like, you know, then, then he could Ziggy Stardust, then he could do, you know, great track. But in those days, well, that's what you learned at the Brill Building in those days was a songwriter. Jerry Leibus used to say to me, you will never be a professional songwriter or a producer until you can do it with two or three different kinds of artists. You know, so the time I took Melissa Manchester, Midnight Blue, I'm doing I Was Made For Loving You. And then I was doing, you know, like something else with, an, with, with another artist. I mean, you, your track record, it, it's crazy. It's even, you go back to, there's an interview with John Lennon, and he and he's talking to some reporter. If you want to hear I Want to Hold Your Hand, honey, then that's great, but I've grown it. And it just, it show, you know, you, you, you grow and there's right. different types. Of, even our record collection, there's no rule to say, this is all we got to write is Detroit Rock City, Detroit... Kiss grew, and it, even right. the songs. Now, the songs that you wrote with Kiss, being a Kiss fan, being a fan of just music in general, because we're going on all levels right now. We're talking, you and I, from the Brill Building to Ringo to Kiss. Songs like "I Was Made for Loving You," even the song "Shandy," which is such a beautiful song on 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 Mask. It's such a great song, right. Shandy. Well, when you Again, you you sit down and you, you've written songs. You've sit, you've been down. You sit down and you write a song. Yeah, and you write a song, and you're tr trying to make it the, the, the best song that you can write. And then you're always going to reach a point in the song. Uh oh. <laughs> uh, it says your battery is running low. You might want to plug in your PC. Uh oh. Uh oh. We're Russell? running low. Oh, you know what? Russell, where's Russell when we need him? <laughs> I think I got the power cord here. We're going. We're going over overtime over here. Oh, we overtime anyway. No, no, no. I'll let, I'll, no, no. I don't have to run, but I don't want to be rude on your time schedule too. No, I'm fine. Let me just see if he's there. Do you have a second? Can I? Do yeah, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. He's not even here. No, oh, he's not there. Guy. I mean, look for the power cord, which would be somewhere on the side. Oh boy, it's on the back of it. Yeah, somewhere. Hold on a second. Sorry about this stuff. No, don't worry, Vinny. Don't you worry. If it cuts out, we could always redo it a part two. Don't worry, because you're you're great. Where the hell is this ACDC? Oh, there it is. Okay, hold on. Oh. Sorry about that. Man, Vinny, it's okay. Take your time. Don't you worry. I got the one end of the plug. Now I got to put it where it goes in. Oh, I just fell out. Oh. Vinny is great. Thank you, Debbie. Oh, there's Russell. Thanks, Russell. Russell? Russell's in the, in the, he Russell? was in the chat. Mitch Weissman. Okay, we're in. I have to go on the other chair because the problem. Right what was that? Okay, you I'm got here. me. I got you. Okay. Okay. Can you see me? Okay. All right. We just got to put this down. Emily. a little. 
Russell? Oh. You did. Oh, I don't want me. Hey, Russell. There he is. Okay. I'm a little darker now. Sit over That's there. okay. We'll move it. I'll let me move it. Sorry, Steph. That's okay. All right. Okay. I'm sorry, but be so no, long winded about this. No, you don't have to be sorry. I don't, I don't discuss this with a lot of different people. And the reason I don't is because, you know, I'm not that uh, concise. And so I can't really, you know, it's not like I can chronologically just run it off. Oh, yeah, I was with that. Yeah. You make me talk. It's like talking about, you know, growing up in your na old neighborhood. That's I'm just bringing back, you know, and I'll be on, I'm talking out of my head of the stuff because I'm a fan of all this stuff. So I love it, you know, and uh, so was I. You know, I was a fan of all that stuff too. It's just incredible the the work that you, that you've done and and all these songs. I mean, when you go here's online, I punched in. If you if you googled, and this is just not even all of it, but just you you look at what Vinny has done in '67, a lifetime loving you, and '76, be somebody. <laughs> you got what he did with Gene. Well, that was the whole Melissa five albums with Melissa Manchester, Midnight Blue. That was yeah. like top. For top three record with her. She was an oh, incredible singer. Incredible. Incredible song. Incredible song. We wrote a great song with her called uh, uh, Be Somebody. And we wrote a top 10 song called Just Too Many People. She was an incredible songwriter. Working with her was just, and the guys in her band was just a, a great, great experience. Wow. She was an incredible singer and, and, and songwriter. I mean, the music. You, the and music we had some other you... things too, but I don't know. I, you, no, you did so much. I mean, look at this with the Ronettes. How does it feel? I mean, come on. The, the, the music, yeah. You, I'm just going down a list, the, the stuff that you've done. And I don't even know where to begin with you. Okay, we were on. We were talking about Unmask, right? Before we got cut off, we talked about Shandy. Then you also part of N Naked City off of that record with Simmons. That was with... Um, uh... God. Who was the other writer on that? The, uh, it's Gene. Bob Kulik is on it, it says. And it's and somebody else. And it's, uh, I, I can't Blues pronounce, I'm gonna, Blues. I'm gonna pronounce Blues the name Magoos. Like, Blues Magoos. Is that it is? Blues Magoos? It's very famous. There's a guy named let me see, hold on, let me put it up there. Oh, and I oh, is it oh Pepe, Pepe Castro. Pepe. <laughs> yeah. So when you get my age, every once in a while you get a little pothole in the brain. I was a member of Blues Magoos. That's right. Yeah, he formed the Blues Magoos. Balance, Pepe, uh, Blues Magoos, Balance, and there was another group with, with uh, Q. Pepe's very active. In the, I actually was going to have him come on the show, Pepe. Oh, he, oh, he did. I no, I'm going to have him. I, I reached yeah. out oh, to him, and then great, I got great talent. Another great talent. It just you know sometimes that name you know you would say oh yeah, and then it was then blank. <laughs> Pepe, and I see him every day on Facebook. And you, you, know. you know Mitch Weissman, by the way? No, I don't. That's Mitch's friends with Pepe. I know Pepe. him, but I don't. Okay, yeah, he's, I don't. he's in the chat. He he uh, played McCartney in Beatlemania. Oh, okay, right, right. That's right. That's right. right. I know he's Mitch a, Weissman, but I don't know him. You yeah. Know, like, like, I know I Pepe. It. We wrote a song together, and um, a friend of mine was in the first Blues Magoos as a bass player, uh, Cooker Lepresti, who went on to be the bass player in... in uh, uh, Melissa's band and also did some things with uh, play with Elton at uh, uh, Wembley and stuff like that. But just just you know. great stuff, great yeah. great stuff. So the Unmasked record on that thing that because that at that point when Unmasked came out, that's when Peter, that was his last record supposedly with Kiss. Then and that was the end of that. Uh, that was the last record that he toured. With Kiss on, I think I don't yes. even know if they, I don't know if he played the Unmasked album or not. So he's not even on know, it, that, huh? They no, just he didn't you. play. He okay. didn't play on it. Okay. No, uh, <clears throat> Anton played on it. Anton played on that. Anton played on Dynasty and and Unmasked. You know, and not because Peter wasn't. You know, whatever whatever was going on there just made the situation impossible for me to be the kind of person they were having faith in to make a great album. Yeah. We all came to the conclusion that at that point that this would be the easiest way to do it and the best way for everybody concerned at that point. Yeah. And to get the job done, because that time you're paying the studio time too, you know, you're paying. Well, I mean, <laughs> yeah. you know, you're a producer, you're in a studio with Kiss, you know, you don't want to, you know, you know, I had, I'm fortunate to have a great engineer, Jay Messina. 
mm-hmm. you know, who I relied on heavily, who was just such a talented guy himself. <clears throat> you know, and you got the guys in the studio, and you know, you you just there's a a, a certain level that you aspire to, and you know, that's that's what drives you every day. You know, it's got to be, you know, it's got to be right. It's got to be yeah. right. And we, you know it's right. <laughs> and when everybody agrees, that sounds great. Okay, wow. But up until that point, if there's something wrong, if it doesn't yeah. feel good or stuff, you know what it is. You've been yeah. in that situation. Yeah. Just that way. But then when you hit it and you say, wow, I love this. Where yeah. the hell's that chorus been? I've been That's trying to write a chorus for this song. But <laughs> all of a sudden, there it is. There it is. It's just like magic, you know? Maybe sometimes you right. got to step outside exactly. of the picture. You're in the picture. You can't see the colors. Sometimes you got to breathe and step outside to see it. You Absolutely. Know, that's it. Absolutely. Whatever, but whatever it takes, though. Yeah. Whatever know, it takes. Whatever I it mean, takes. Whatever it takes. And you, that's that's the great thing about you know writing commercial and learning how to write songs in the Brill Building in those days, because one day you're writing a song for Elvis Presley, the next day you're writing a song for Barbara Lewis, <laughs> and the next day you're writing a song for Bobby V, and the next day you're writing a song for you know like, you know. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, Ruby and the Romantics, yeah. <laughs> all different kinds of songs and all kinds of things, you know. And you, you all have your oh, you know. And the, the great thing about oh yeah, they're looking for a Mary Wells kind of song. Okay, so am I. <laughs> <laughs> so am I, you know. But Smokey Ryan, I don't think I'm going to be Smokey on that one. Beat me to the punch and all that. <laughs> but it was always like you tried to, you know, you didn't want to copy, you know. Yeah. But you know, you know, you had, you know, so you ended up with a Barbara. I didn't write it, but like a Barbara Lewis, like you know, yeah, Hello Stranger. But you can see how the two things are the same, you know, the vibe and stuff like that. So yeah, yeah, yeah. You learn how to. You learn, Mike. Jerry used to say, "You can do this. You, can, you know, if you if they want a, this kind of song, you know, you you get that little vibe in there, but you make it your own, you know, and you learn how to do that as a songwriter. So then yeah. later on, when you come into a situation where you can't get it right or you're trying to figure out what you can do, you can, you know, go back and use those tools and those skills that you develop. The biggest uh, roadblock and make things happen in the studio for anybody, whether it's songwriting musician." is when there's a problem. Somebody associated with that session has to be able to solve that problem. I don't care if it's the, <laughs> I don't care if it's the guitar player, the tape boy, the producer. So you know what? That's too fast. You know, we're trying to, you know what? Slow it down. You know, I love yeah. that. You know, <laughs> that could come from anywhere. You know that, uh, you know, the people you've been in bands, you know any stupid, and you'll take it. You don't care where it comes from. No. You know? No, you don't. Solving problems in the studio is a big thing to be able to do that, not to look and say, you know, oh, what the hell are we doing now? You know, this guy. You got to be like in the movie Pulp Fiction, The Wolf. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. He comes in, Harvey Keitel. You know, he comes in, he comes the, in and he solves the problem. He, he solves just it. solves the problem. Get in and there, you have to be that, that guy. Clean yeah. that stuff in the. <laughs> right, right. It takes yeah. a certain personality because when you're dealing with bands, with kids like Kiss, for example, different personalities, you got to be in there to make, right. it, make the team look. And they look at you and they say, "Hey, you're the producer. You're getting paid to do this. Yeah. <laughs> you know, thrill me. <laughs> you know what I mean? Make it right." I mean, Vinny. To this day, I was made for loving you. It's still in their set to this day. They're still playing that song oh, yeah. live. Yeah, because it was so popular. It's a, it's it was a great really song. Now, how, song. How about another song that makes people want to dance back in the air from I Was Made for Love and You? Tell me a little before I let you get out of here because I'm bugging. And I'm, I'm, I'm going to stay with you on that. I'm going to call you after here. I'm going to call you every day now. I want to know everything about you. You make me feel like dancing. Leo say it. Tell me about that tune and that production. Uh, as I said earlier, whenever Richard would be producing somebody, you know, and if I wasn't working on it with him as a, an associate producer or whatever, I was still, he would always call me, say, you got to write songs with the, you know, with the, you know, we got to write songs, you got to write, you know, write for this or write for that album, write for these people. And uh, <clears throat> at the time I was in Los Angeles living, we were living there. And uh, if I wasn't doing something myself, I said, yeah, I'll come down, I'll work on it. And so when he calls me, he says, I got this uh, track there was a groove in the studio going on. The musicians were just grooving on this little track, you know, and then in their track, 
which was like something you do with like in between takes or like like people just hanging around to, and then, and then <laughs> Richard being the minor that he was say what is that oh let me hear that again you know kind of thing like and it was just like a little groove and then he made a little copy of it and uh he said he gave it to me and uh he said uh, you and Leo should go in and write a song around this this little girl I said okay so he was in uh, he was in Laurel Canyon, I think. It was on a Saturday that I wanted to go over there. I had like I was playing a lot of tennis. I had chiropractic problems with my back, and I couldn't sit up. And I said, you know, <laughs> I ran over to Leo. I said, we got to do this real quick because I can't even sit up. You know, and I got like about so we sat down and and, and started working with it and stuff like that. And he had some ideas lyrically, you know. And then I was said, then I, we did like that. I did like that B section. I did the key change into the chorus. It may, may have taken an hour. <laughs> I mean, to lay out the, you know, the, 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 the you know, the, the whole bed of, uh, you know, instrumentally what it, what it was, you know, because at the beginning it was just a verse. There was no chorus. There was no, there was no beat section. There was just a dan and dan 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 you know, just like that kind of thing. And uh, that's the way that happened with that, you know, and that was very quick and, uh, and then when he cut it, you know, the, and he called me up. He said, you know, the, the first single from Leo's album, from the Endless Flight album, is going to be When I Need You. Great song written by Al Hammond and, uh, yes. and uh, Cal, Cal Sager, who wrote a lot of hits with Melissa, another terrific talent that was always in, in there punching. Um, I said, well, I love that song. You know the song. When I need you, yeah, of course. Yeah, I'll right. sing it for you, but I'll kill yeah. the song right now. <laughs> <laughs> but a great song and a great vocal father. Leo was a really, really talented guy. Really good, so good, good singer. He had that like. nice voice. Is even I think it was even pre Sinai Fever before that you heard that high, you know, voice. I, right. I believe. Right. Um. And uh, I said, I said, great. Oh, I love that song. Yeah. Then he calls me back two days later. He said, uh, Vim, <laughs> Richard, <laughs> I went over to Warner Brothers and uh, they, 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 and you know what the first single is? I said, when I need you, uh-uh, you make me feel like dancing. I said, what? <laughs> he said, yeah, they think that this song is a smash. Wow. I, and it wasn't the most, you know, coolest kind of, you know, I mean, but for, what we did with that record, which which was really cool, Richard, that, you know, Richard said, you know, did you ever hear like, uh, you know, peanuts, peanuts? Oh, 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 oh. I can't get, I can't hit my phone. See, yeah, I'm, not, to... I'm not a first tenor anymore. Oh. <laughs> oh, look at Kim, you know, that high falsetto thing and the thing, you know, you know, so he got uh, uh, Leo to do that on this song, you know. I did a sweet bad talking, which was not unusual for singers to do something in, you know, in in uh, in falsetto kind of thing, you know. Um, yeah. Eddie uh, from the Temptations would do that. It's Eddie Kendricks, name. yes. Eddie Hendricks, you know, was really good on. You know, it was a thing Amazing. that a lot of singers did did some falsetto things and stuff like that, and half falsetto. You know, you know what it's like going from the falsetto into the regular voice, that break thing that yeah. happens and stuff. You have to be good to do that. It's... I mean, it's not something that you know, you know. <clears throat> that doesn't Eddie Kendricks it, uh, and De David Ruffin together, they were able to cover right. both ends. Yeah. Exactly. So, uh, Richard, that came with Richard with a great idea. And Richard and then Leo jumped all over that. I, I don't know whether who started did it first, but you know, Leo said, Oh, yeah, Leo said, I could sing that, I can do that kind of thing. And then that's the way that was born. And when it came out, it was uh, number one <laughs> on three different charts. And uh, Crazy. Richard made a great record, had some great background singers on there with the girls and, you know, great uh, Steve Gadd and, you know, Ray Parker and a lot of guys playing on that on, on that track and stuff like that. It was a real groove track. So the and trick then, is... Know, a couple other songs together. So the trick but is... We also had another guy with us too, Johnny Vistano, who also wrote with, uh, with Leo on that album too, who was... Another writer that was with me grew up in Providence, and uh -huh. then <clears throat> Richard would say, I'll "Call Johnny and get together, and write a song for this." And or you know, or with Leo. So, I mean, it was like a, it was like you know, 
potpourri of, of yeah. Uh, but the trick is on that is to get a songwriter with a bad back so you get it really quick, get in and get out, and it's going to be a hit. <laughs> you know, your back's hurting from tense, and that's the trick right there. <laughs> well, there was nothing I could do for my back. I couldn't take any kind of like Advil or Vicodin or anything like that. I would have fell asleep. But what I a said, story! I said, I'm a, I'm, I, you know, but I, you know, I, I sometimes, well, you know, if you've written a song, sometimes, you know five minutes and you write something that, yeah, that was pretty good. Mm -hmm. Then you hear it like a two years later, hey, that was a little piece of thing. But um, a lot of times, like I go to New York with my partner, Al Scott, and we write one and something all day. We work on it. We do this great track. We think it's so great. We wake up the next morning and say, what the hell were we thinking? <laughs> this is terrible. <laughs> you know, terrible. <laughs> Whoa, what was that? You know, but you while you're doing it, you think, you know, you know but that was one of those times. But I, we felt like when we did the B section, you know, with the key change, we went up to the thing, you know. That's great. Well, I liked the light. I did that with a song. Called, I had a song called New York's a Lonely Town that I had yes. a, I did with the trade runs, you know. Yes. We went through, like, and the, the chorus went to the E flat. You know, you went the only surfer boy. Brian Wilson gave us a call after we after we finished that day. Came out, he said, "You know, I want to know you guys. I really like that song, especially when you went to that E flat." And the thing, I said, I hung up the phone. I looked at Peter. I said, "Did, did that, that just happen? What I thought happened? Because we love Brian Wilson. We, you know, everybody loved Brian. You know, I said, but that was Brian Wilson talking about the E flat in the middle of the. That's a great. You know what? Let's look at that song for it. New York's a lonely town. The Trade Winds, yeah. 1965, and supposedly maybe there's more covered by six artists that covered that song. Oh yeah, right. they got a lot of a lot of things on it, you know. Yeah, Dave Edmonds, yeah. he covered it too in '76. Right. Right. And is, like all over the world, people used to use that as like a you know like the radio station, like you know, um, you know, Philly's a lonely town, you know, San yeah. Francisco's a lonely. It was using a lot of. Uh, ads for for the for uh, tokyo's a lonely town it was a big hit in in, in japan you know stuff like that. now i mean you're i mean look at this Vinny. i don't have to tell you do you ever look in the mirror pinch yourself i'm Vinny. That, 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 you know, i mean look be somebody which you did with melissa in manchester was oh, also covered so. by dusty springfield another great one right, right. that makes right. you know th one this of is, my favorite singer she was a great singer she dusty really was she really she was, was everybody Real, it was great. Now you know what? Before we get out of here, before we get my out of here, my favorite one though. Well, let me before yeah. you finish. My yeah. favorite one of all time though. My favorite one of all time. I got tel television on. I'm with my mother, and I'm looking at the D. Martin show. Mm -hmm. And D. Martin says, "You know, we did a song last week uh, from some couple of new songwriters, and we got a lot of response. And we're going to do it again this week of the song called What's Yesterday.'" that we wrote that Dean Martin recorded and he did it twice in a week in a row on his show. And he had that great show, you know, we used to sit down with the girls and all that. My wow. mother was, I mean, yes. everything that I ever did, that was like, she couldn't believe you. Dean Martin is singing your song. She couldn't believe that. I mean, wow. forget about Elvis Presley and everything, you know, and he gave it a little introduction. This is a song that we did last week. We're going to do it again for you. It's a new song called What's Yesterday. And to this day, I'll, I'll never forget that look on her face. So you're sitting with your mom. And just, <laughs> Dean Martin. <laughs> of that, all people, you know. That is crazy. I know. It's great. Me and Peter. Peter and I wrote that. Peter Anders and I wrote so what did your mom say when she heard that and when she seen that? Huh? What did she say? Well, I mean, she went through all my stuff, early stuff with, you know, all the career and all what's, you know, all the different records and stuff. But that one time, yeah. that was different. <laughs> Dean Martin, forget about anybody. <laughs> Dean Martin is singing one of my son's songs. You know, that's like Frank Sinatra, you know, <laughs> as opposed to, uh, you know. That that is one of those that's one of those things where you know what it's a big that's a big thing Sinatra Dean Martin you know th those are the big ones over there. We had a few. Dude. Lou Rawls did some of our stuff too. One of Peter my favorites. A lot of stuff. Peter Anders and a great songwriter, singer songwriter that we worked together. We had a whole fifty year anniversary together. Really, really inspired me. He was a great lead singer. We did a lot of stuff together. Yeah, early stuff, you know, for for the trade winds, the innocents, the critters. We produced together. We had we had hits with you know ourselves with the group Fidel and the trade winds. But so you did okay. You did okay, Vinny, huh? 
You do. I know. <laughs> and when you well, think about I, it, like I, I tell my girl Anne that all the time. She looks at me. She said, "What you got?" I said, "Listen, I used to be somebody, you know. I didn't <laughs> throw that garbage out. <laughs> Clean the dishes, Vinny. Stop. That's <laughs> you know who you're talking to. I used to be somebody." <laughs> <laughs> oh man, Vinny, you know what? This, She's a great girl. This this has been a fun conversation. I'm not even calling I'm it. I'm sorry anything. though. I didn't. I hope I didn't. You know, uh, you didn't get to check off or get into the things that you wanted to ask. No, no, no. You know what? The run thing over is, your whole thing. Honestly, if you have any other questions, we can do it. You know. Honestly, mm-hmm. Vinny, I want to do it again. I'm. I I think the second time we do this, I want to do a Zoom with you because. Okay. Because I keep looking over here because I'm trying to right. fix the internet because it's bouncing, trying to bounce me out. Okay. And your okay. stories are so good. We got to do another. You can be my friend. Now. All right, we'll do it again. We'll do hey, part two. Do you think Kenny's going to be jealous of our friendship? <laughs> Kenny's, a, if, Kenny's the most giving person he is. that I know. He will meet somebody, you know, this. you've got to see this guy, Stefan. He's a great guy. I did. I'm telling you. And I'll say, yeah, well, you know, interviews, they're going to want to know. Yeah, that, you know, I mean, well, Ringo, when he used to get drunk and Phil Spector with guns. I don't talk about that stuff with my, yeah. about my friend. I only talk about the music. I'm not interested, <clears throat> you know, in that, you know, all of that. I'm not want you to I'm going to my friends. Yeah. And I'm, I'm so glad, you know, that's not, that's, you know, when I saw your stuff that you did, I knew there was going to be quality work. And he, Kenny said, I told you, this guy knows what he's doing. And, you know, and he, you know, he's very, very, very well, well versed. He's a musician. He's, a, he's been in bands. He knows what he's talking about. It's not, this is not a, you know, a, hey, what happened when you got drunk with Ringo and he shaved, you know, his, <laughs> all his hair off? Yes, <laughs> I'm sure he got his own his own skeletons in his closet that he did. Those stories that. have been told behind the music VH1. They told all those stories, you know. I know. I my show is I wanted to make it like we're in the studio, we're on tour, a conversation of guys from the same place but different places right. having a great conversation, and that's what's right. fun. That's well, it's, it's 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 you know it's what we did you know yeah. we're musicians we're songwriters it's what we do it's who you know it's not who we are but it's what we did and and we always try to do it the best that we could and that was that was our mantra that was everybody's mantra in those days it, it, not it just really me was. not just Carol King not just Don Covey not just Rich but everybody wanted to be the best that they could be I mean as corny and, and as as uh, simplistic as that sounds it's, it's what we did but you did it. We didn't know any better. Mm-hmm. You guys did it. You really did do okay. it. N- now, I'm going to ask you, before we get out of here, because the internet is hocking me China. I could see it. I'm okay. going to ask you a personal question now. Okay. Don't get offended. It's going to be tough. You have to give me top, five top of your vinyl albums that mean something to you. Not something that you worked on, just maybe something that, that you love. If you're on a desert island, these are the five albums that I'm going to bring with me. This, okay. You know? Uh, Steely Dan Asia, Ray Charles, The Genius Hits the Road, uh, uh, Led Zeppelin, uh, was it Unho- what the Most Holy? What was the one? Was Houses it? of the Holy. King the, what's it called? Is it the one Houses of the Holy with the with the, Houses of the, with Holy. the kids? Okay. Uh, Brian Wilson, Pet Sounds. Obviously, that's uh, Sergeant Pepper. But, and also the Four Freshmen. Uh, four freshmen. Uh, which one is it? Five guitars. Or what? I was greatly influenced by the four freshmen, as was uh, Brian Wilson. I that was one of the first things that I. That's how I started listening to harmony. I was like 12, 13 years old. My brother-in-law introduced me to jazz. The first thing I started, he let me play with the four freshmen. I could not get over how well, how well they sang. <clears throat> one of the freshman albums. Uh, God, I get Stevie won the talking book. I mean, I, it would be more than five. It's got to be more than five. But, <laughs> we can, but, but, but you know what? The four I, freshmen. I, four freshmen. I was. I love listening to that. I could listen to that now. I could listen to early Ray Charles too. You know all that stuff. But okay, the but the five. Today. That'll be it. I'll, I'll make the number one is the four freshmen. That's the one that that touched your heart and that made you. Yeah, who you early are. on, you know, early. when I was like twelve or thirteen, the four freshmen. I it. said, you know, I, I'd love to be able to do that. And then, and then that's it. That is it. That made Vinny and yeah. Vinny. 
you made a lot of hits and a lot of people happy. And you probably made a lot of babies to your music too. So anybody who's watching with their babies, Uh-oh. thank Vinny. I wasn't even in town. I mean, I was, I was... <laughs> Vinny, don't go nowhere. We're going to sign off. But everybody who's watching, give us a thumbs up. Make sure you subscribe. And you know, there's going to be a part two, much more of Vinny to come along because there's too many stories. But don't hang up. Wait, Vinny, I'm going to make an intro right now. We will see everybody later. We love okay. you. Bam. Love you too. Those crazy kids, they're still here. Now, after this ends, I want you to click on that box over there because it's something special. I'll see everybody later.